Go ahead and get started. Uh, Mark chapter 12 tonight. I hope that you have your Bible and you're ready to go. Uh, tonight we'll uh, do what we have not been doing, which is we're going to sort of dip into another gospel. We're going to look at uh, Matthew just briefly. Um, but normally we're just staying in the gospel of Mark and, and seeing what he says about it. Um, although others may have chimed in about um, about what we're talking about as far as uh, Matthew, Luke, or John. But tonight, uh, the parable of the tenants, Jesus tells a parable to the, um, the Pharisees that were there, the teachers of the law. Um, and actually, we're going to back up a little bit to sort of capture all this. Jesus is at the, he's at the temple. Now, before he goes to the temple, um, in Matthew, Matthew records this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. Jesus says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I've longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, in Mark chapter 12, Jesus has already made the, the uh, entry into uh, Jerusalem and people had um, uh, praised his, his name in Mark 11, uh, verses 9 um, and 10. And so he enters Jerusalem. He's there, he goes in and he's, he's, uh, he's been teaching and verse 18 though in chapter 11 i know we're in 12 but we're going to back up just a little bit hello becky um the chief priest in uh, mark chapter 11 verse 18 the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him because jesus had overturned the tables of the, the money changers, and he said um, in his teaching, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And so uh, that's, uh, that's what we looked at last week. And so Jesus says this, and they didn't take kindly to that, um, uh, the chief priests and the, and the teachers of the law heard and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, so they were coming along. Okay, you remember the fig tree that was that had been cursed, and it was uh, dried up uh, from the roots up. It was it had withered. And Jesus talks about their faith, have faith in God. Um, and then, verse 27, they arrived again in Jerusalem. And while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders came to him. And they wanted to know, by what authority are you doing these things? Like, what authority do you have to turn over the tables of the money changers why are you behaving like this? Who has given you this authority? So he says, I'll ask you a question, answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Verse 30 of chapter 11 of Mark, 
John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. And they discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he'll, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say um, of human origin, uh, they feared the people. Everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they, they answered Jesus, we don't know. <laughs> and Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Well, that didn't go very well for them. And Jesus began to speak to them in parables. Now, he's still in, at, at the temple. And he's still uh, dealing with these uh, chief priests, the, the teachers of the law, and the elders. They're there, and he is going to speak a parable to them. Now, they're going to figure out that he's talking about them. So let's look at this. Mark chapter 12. This is pretty good. It's really sad is what it is because these are people that should have been helping the, the people get closer to God, but that really wasn't what they were doing. Doesn't seem, I mean, or Jesus wouldn't have been upset uh, with with what how they were doing things. And you remember last week we talked about the fig tree and how it didn't, it had leaves advertising that it should have figs, even though it wasn't time for figs. But Jesus was hungry, goes up to it, expecting to find figs because of the leaves and uh, the advertisement, you know, that, hey, I have something for you to satisfy your hunger. But when he goes up there, it doesn't have any leaves. And so he curses the fig tree. And may, you know, no one, no one's going to eat fruit from you again. And then they noticed, the disciples did, that it was withered from the roots up. So that's what took place. And it's sort of akin to what was going on at the temple. Jesus goes in and he turns the, the tables over. And he is, uh, he's upset with what's going on because it's supposed to be a connector of the people to God. But it wasn't being used that way. It's supposed to be a house of prayer for all the nations. wasn't wasn't being used in that fashion, according to what Jesus is is doing here. And so the the temple was supposed to function like that. It was it was supposed to function as something that uh, took care of the needs of the people. In other words, it helped them connect to God. The temple did. Just like the fig tree was designed to help um, sustain a person, um, to feed you with figs. But it didn't. And so the temple was falling short as well here. And these men were the ones that were um, sort of in charge of all this. And they were really upset with Jesus because he wasn't messing around. And they're wondering, where do you get this authority? Because they get their authority from God. And they would know, in their minds at least, that this guy is not getting his authority from God, where they're getting their authority. Uh, but obviously, they didn't understand that God is standing right in front of them. So they, uh, they're they there, and, and in chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus began to speak to them in parables. Now, here's the parable. Uh, a man, now think about the temple, okay, and what it's supposed to do, but what they were doing with it as we go through this uh, parable here. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit from the, of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Now you remember Jesus lamenting over the city of Jerusalem before he comes into it, saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, um, I would have liked to gather you together as a hen would gather her chicks under her wings, but you weren't willing. And it's a sad, that was a sad time for Jesus because 
these are the people that uh, are supposed to be following God, and they're not um, they're they're not paying attention to what God is doing through Jesus. And so here it is: they uh, the, the the servant has been sent, and uh, he is there to collect some fruit from the vineyard from these tenants. And they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. Verse 4, chapter 12 of Mark. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. And you remember Jesus saying in Matthew 23, um, that you who stone the prophets and kill those sent to you, all right? Um, verse 6. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. Well, I wonder who that is. He sent him, last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And so they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Haven't you read that? Jesus is saying, Then the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. Do you think? But they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him and went away. They're going to do this. They're going to get Jesus. And that was their intent. And so, but they have to be careful the way they go about it. You know, some people are sneaky that way. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to indict God on uh, charges that um, that he is uh, he's a liar and that he is um, not who he says he is, right? Jesus is uh, dealing with these Pharisees, the uh, teachers of the law, the the uh, elders. Um, he's dealing with them very fairly, but he points this, this parable at them, and they recognize it. So verse 13. Later, they sent some. Now, who are they? Well, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. They were looking for a way to arrest Jesus. So what did they do? Verse 13, they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. Okay. So verse 14, they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. They're not, they don't believe this. They're just saying it. Uh, you aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. But you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Now, they didn't believe that at all. It is, is it right for us is it right to pay the imperial tax? Um, and the footnote in my Bible says, a special tax levied on subject peoples, not on Roman citizens. So it was a tax on the Jews. Is it right for us to pay this, the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? That's the question. But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. He saw through their duplicity, I think uh, one version may say. 
he could see that there's a question here and they frame it in a way that uh, it's, it sounds good. It sounds like they're, they're believing that he is a, a teacher from God and that he teaches God's word just the way God would want it. We don't believe that at all. But so on the surface, they have something going on. But beneath the surface, there are sinister motives. It's sort of like if you watch a duck, you know, on the water and uh, on the top of the water, everything looks calm. But on, in the in the water, below the water, the the uh, the uh, legs are going 90 miles an hour. Um, and so that's what's happening here. There's something going on on the surface with the questioning. Sounds good, but that's not the truth. Jesus sees through this and he says to them, <clears throat> verse 15, why are you trying to trap me? So he knows. Bring me a denarius and, and let me look at it. And they brought the coin, and uh, and he asked them, "Whose image is this? And and who whose inscription? I mean, what's the picture on it? And what does it say on it? Well, it says they said Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, "Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God." What is God's? And they went, and they were amazed at him. Well, then the Sadducees are going to come along, and they're going to take a shot at him. But let's let's think about this for just a moment. Jesus says, "Give back to Caesar what's Caesar's, and give to God what's God's." Well, what what belonged to God? Well, the temple did, right? And uh, they were making it into. Jesus says into, and he quoted scripture, uh, you're making it into a den of robbers, which is a quote um, from the Old Testament. He's quoting Jeremiah and Isaiah here in uh, verse 17 of chapter 11. Excuse me. Um, My house will be called a house of prayer for the nations. That's what it was supposed to be, but it wasn't being used for that. And uh, you've made my... Uh, but you've made it a den of robbers. So he's going back to the Old Testament for these for these quotes and bringing it current. And you can go back and read those. But um, Jesus is saying, uh, you give to God what belongs to God and Caesar what belongs to Caesar. It's, it's not that hard of a question. Um, so the trap didn't work. And I'm sure they were upset about that. I'm sure the rest of the gang, when they got back to them and told them what he had said, they didn't like that very well. So that didn't work. Their plan sort of fell through. But what Jesus says is key. It's important. Um, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. Now, these people that were trying to trap him, they were supposed to be the, the most religious. I mean, they were supposed to be very close to God. And the problem is, is that they were far from him. And uh, they weren't living like God wanted them to live. Jesus had followers and they were always getting on to the followers and to Jesus as well for the things that they did, how they did them. But Jesus is wanting, I I believe he wants every human being, you included, me included, to give back to God what belongs to God. Um, The way I see it, God has given me life. So what do I give back to him? Well, it's very simple. I give him my life. Uh, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20. And that's the way it should be. That's the way I should live. That's the way I believe you should live. If you're following Jesus, that's how we should live. We should give him what belongs to him. And if we've turned our lives over to him, 
we have um, confessed that yes, we are. I, I, if I've confessed, I'm a sinner, and I'm and I believe wholeheartedly that God can do something about that through Jesus. My sins can be forgiven. I have faith in Him that that can take place, and I repent. I turn from my sins, and. I'm buried with him in baptism for the remission or the forgiveness of my sins. And so faith um, demands a, re a response. We don't just say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. No, if we, we do what uh, the early Christians did, right? If Scripture says they believed in Jesus. They weren't saying they were just acknowledging that he lived. It's all, they were all in. Yeah. Sometimes today, uh, it can be cheapened, that idea of belief or even faith, you know. But Paul is saying, listen, uh, in, in Romans 6, don't you remember that uh, you were, at your baptism, you were buried with Christ and you were raised to this new life. And so we believe that uh, we, will, we will be with him. We will be connected. We are connected to him. We have this new life. And so we're all in. We give everything to God through Jesus. And that's the point. Jesus is, I think, really wanting them to give themselves all the way to God. And some of them, I mean, at this point, uh, Saul of Tarsus, who was a Pharisee, right? He would change. People could change. Pe people can see Jesus for who he truly is. Now, they didn't, and Saul of Tarsus did not, but he did, finally. And Jesus got his attention. Now that event doesn't happen every day. Um, God was going to use Saul of Tarsus to be the apostle Paul to the Gentiles. Being a Jew, he's going to go to the Gentiles. So, But that's in the future. And now Jesus is standing in the temple, in the temple courts, and, and he's teaching the people and, and the Pharisees and the the scribes and the the, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, the others. Where, where am I? Let's see here. Yes, they uh, the teachers of the law. Did I say that? Anyway, they they were there, but they were wanting to to put Jesus to the test. They they were angry about what God, what Jesus said to them. Um, I don't know. Have you ever been angry with someone if, you know, they told you the truth? <laughs> we can we can get upset with people for telling us the truth when we know it's the truth. Um, they are denying all the miracles. They're denying everything. But it says here in verse 17 of chapter 12 of Mark, and they were amazed at him these ones that they sent to trip him up, you know, Pharisees and Herodians. They're going to catch him in his words, and they didn't do it, but they were amazed at him. But being amazed at Jesus doesn't mean that you're going to follow him, right? I mean, it doesn't always mean that. So Jesus is saying, give to God what belongs to God. The way I see it, I owe him my very life. He's my sustainer. He's my redeemer. He's the one that, that gave me breath. And I live on this earth, and I'm glad to. Uh, I, uh, and, and I, so I always try to take him in. Well, yeah, I always try to take him into consideration, right? There are times that I sin, that I miss the mark, that I don't do what I should do. And thank God that his sacrifice of Jesus, the blood that was shed, on the cross, that is enough. It's enough for us to um, 
have our sins cleansed. And John says in 1 John chapter 1 that, you know, as Christians, if we confess our sins, if we sin, we confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So after you become a Christian, after you're in Christ and you, you're wanting to give it all to God and continually do that all the time, and, but you mess up, you don't do it like you want to, what do you do? You confess your sin. When? I suggest as soon as you realize it. And you may be ashamed of yourself for some of the things you've done, but own up to it, confess it, and realize that if you're in Christ, then his blood continually cleanses us. God is able to do that. How does he do it? I, it it's, he does it. He says he does, and that's part of my faith. I believe that he does, and I hope that's yours as well, because that helps us continue on when we mess up. Otherwise, we're, we sin and we're out, you know, we could be, we could come to Christ, um, believing in him, the repenting of our sins and, and, uh, be baptized into him, being clothed with him. And then we go out and we sin eventually. And then we're done. It's hell for us, right? No, no. I'm glad that if I give my life over to God, he takes care of my life. Yes, even when I sin. My part is to bring that to him and, and acknowledge it. If we confess, John says in 1 John, if we confess, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive my sins. Why am I talking about that? Because Jesus says, give to God what is God's. And, and I believe we're to give everything to him. Let him have full access to us. It is life changing to do that. It, your, your worry goes down, right? Because worry, because if you begin to worry about things, you realize you can take it to God. And when you do that, then things that you worry about, they just become prayer bullet points. And so you you learn because I, I want to stop worrying, you know, everyone does, I think. And so if I continue to do that, let's say, um, what I'm doing is just I'm I'm making bullet points for prayer. I'm concerned about this. You know, con people say, well, concern is just another word for worry. You know, you're concerned about it. That's the <laughs> that's the way to say it when you don't want to admit that you're worried. But uh, so when I'm concerned about things, I learn to turn that over to God. Give him that. Give him full access of, of my life. It's not that he doesn't know it anyway. So when Jesus says in Mark chapter 12, verse 17, listen, it was simple for him. Should we pay tax to Caesar? Well, of course. Who's on the coin? Picture of Caesar. Inscription to Caesar. Give it back to Caesar. Yes, pay your taxes. But um, you need to give to God what is God's. Now, for them, that would have been, you, you need to change the way you see me, is what Jesus would be, would be saying. And also, they needed to change the way they're, they're doing the temple, okay? Because that's sort of part of this, at least the way I see it. He's still there in the temple courts, and he is teaching the people, and then they come up, and they're uh, trying, to, trying to trap him with their question, and uh, they, they can't do that. But So Jesus is wanting everything um, to be turned over to God. It just works better that way, I believe. It's not blind faith. I mean, it's, it's faith that works and faith that is active. And, and it's amazing when you begin to see what God 
can do and is doing in your life. And you open your eyes up to that. It's quite amazing. And you give him the honor. You give him the thanks that he deserves. And you tell others about him. That is part of giving to God what is God's. Because if he is creator, and I believe that he is, I mean, he created Adam and Eve, and then here we are, right? Um, so we're here because God wants us to be. That's the way I see it. And if we're here, then he loves us. And he wants us to understand that, and he wants us to give our lives over to him. Give to God what is God's. So, <coughs> I think that's probably a good place for us to stop. The next attack Jesus has comes from the Sadducees in verse 18 of Mark 12. And so we'll dive into that uh, next, uh, next week and see what Jesus has to say in response. They're going to ask him a question. It's always been a funny, sort of an odd questioning to me because they're asking about the resurrection and the Sadducees don't even believe that there will be a resurrection. So, But they're asking him this question about it anyway. So a lot of strange things going on here when, when religious leaders are trying to trap, <laughs> trap God in a, in a body, right? The, he's, he's right there in front of them, God is, and they don't recognize him. They, they can't see him. Um, and they're getting hung up on um, a lot of other things. But Jesus is entertaining their questions, and he's giving honest answers, <coughs> as you would expect God to. So let's, uh, let's, let's close with a prayer, and I hope to see you next week. Father, thank you for the opportunity you've given us to look at your word and may we be people that seek to give back to you what belongs to you, our very lives, everything about us. Help us to um, seriously contemplate that this week, to think about, have we really turned everything over to you? It's not really a scary prospect, but um, when we think about what... Uh, you know, what you can do with with our lives. And, and I think uh, you do a much better job at directing my life than I do. And I thank you for that. So uh, for some of us, it may, it may be a scary prospect to turn everything over to you because we may be people that um, we may want to hang on to bits of our lives and uh, control those. Um, some of us like control, and you know that. But help us to be able to see and work with us as I know that you are patient and you love us and you're willing. So we thank you that um, you are wanting us to turn over to you what belongs to you. I thank you, Father, for these uh, good people that are uh, watching and, and uh, studying along with me. Thank you for them and bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, I'll see you next week and uh, I, I hope that you have a good rest of the week and that you think about this, um, turning everything over to God or giving back to God what belongs to God and maybe defining what that is. Thanks, Becky. It's good to have you on here. And uh, there are others. I can't see everyone, but I can see Becky's, Becky's name. So I'm glad that you all joined me. God bless you. See you next week.